and I'll go blind all my whole neighborhood. If I get mad at someone, I'll just blind them and I'll write checks out. What's the value of an eye? A thousand dollars, all right? Boom, 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 boom. I'm gonna go blind all my enemies and here, just give out some checks. <laughs> Sin in Judaism is something that might be a bit different than it's viewed in other faiths. One way to sort of paint the picture is kind of looking at the root of sin. In both faiths, we believe that the first sin was the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the results of what that sin was and how that affected individuals is partially where we differ. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden are told not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Uh, they disobey, they eat from it anyway, and that begins a, a whole new world. Uh, that They now become mortal beings, they now become beings that pass away, and this is something that's transferred into their descendants, and all human beings since then have been affected by that. Our tradition also teaches that there were things that had changed in the universe, that the universe functioned different before they sinned, and now we are confined to the uh, more physical way of seeing things, ego entered the person. There were a lot of changes that went on. One difference, though, in Christianity, for example, and I'm speaking very broad brush because I want to give justice to the, the faith itself. There are so many different denominations and the way that each denomination views sin and original sin uh, may have varying effects, but one sort of general idea that comes out from the very first sin in other faiths, particular, particularly Christianity, is that from that point on, from the original sin, the human being became essentially tainted. The human being was now a being of sin, essentially evil at its, at its root. And tainted and blemished, and only now, because it's blemished, the only way that can so we can sort of reconcile that difference between us blemished human beings, essentially evil, blemished beings, is to believe in their Messiah as our Savior, and that, that would be the thing that reunites a person with God. That's sort of the Christian perspective, that the person, because of the human being, because of the very first sin, became a blemished creature, became a blemished being. In Judaism, the idea is that, yes, there was an effect. There was an effect on the human being. The ego entered into the human being before the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. The human being, the eyes viewed the world almost as like a window to objective actual reality. When the sin happened, instead of a window to reality, it became more of a, a mirror of reality. And so everything that a person saw was really a reflection of their own ego. It was a, it was a reflection of what's going on inside of you. The ego entered into the human being. But the human being himself or herself remained a spiritual a connected creature, a godly creature. A human being remained a divine spark, a piece of God, only that it had this ego or evil inclination that was also trying to, had its own uh, ways that it was manifesting and trying to lure the person uh, off the path. But the person is essentially good. And this, this also kind of ties in with the idea of how repentance from sin is viewed in Christianity and in Judaism. So in Christianity, since the person is essentially flawed, essentially blemished, essentially tainted, the only way of achieving any sort of salvation, only way of repenting is to follow their formula of accepting their doctrines, and that is what will bridge the gap from you evil human being to the wonderful holy God. In Judaism, the human being is essentially holy, essentially good, and essentially godly. Only sometimes that divine spark gets covered over by certain sins. And so the idea of repentance in Judaism isn't repenting, so to speak, or the way that it's commonly thought. It's returning, returning to your core, returning to who you already are inside.
in Judaism, the idea of getting married, the idea of intimate relations, the idea of establishing a family is something of key importance. In and of itself, it's a good and holy venture. In other faiths, you see, getting married is sort of a necessary evil. It's being that a human being is a weak creature, it needs another, it needs a spouse, and intimacy is not really a good thing, but reluctantly, because you have to, uh, because we are weak, celibacy it would be the ideal, it, we're weak creatures, so reluctantly it permits uh, relations and and having a family. And it's in order to establish a family. So there's a sort of reluctant acceptance. We find this in early Christianity as well, where there's this reluctant acceptance. Like you're, you can get married and intimacy is, is fine, but it's only because the human being is weak and the human being can't be celibate. But if we could be celibate in an ideal world, that would be the ultimate, that would be the goal. Islam is a little bit different than Christianity. In Islam, one thing that we find is that uh, Islam correctly does not see uh, intimacy as something uh, bad or something unnatural or something sinful. Uh, at the same time, Islam doesn't look at the idea of marriage and of intimacy in particular as something that's inherently holy. So in Christianity, there's a lot of reluctance and sin attached to intimacy. In Islam, there's a recognition that this is a, 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 a good thing, a positive thing, that, but ultimately it's not necessarily a holy thing. It's not, not an idea. One of the things that you see, interestingly enough, when it comes to the idea of intimacy and marriage, relating, com comparing Judaism and Christianity would be the idea of, there's a, there's a debate and discussion, in an ideal world, in the perfect scenario, would intimacy be a part of it? In fact, this question is asked by our sages, the Jewish sages, whether Adam and Eve had relations in the Garden of Eden. In other words, in that idyllic environment, in the perfect world, would that be something that was a part of it? The Jewish sages said yes, that was a part of it. The early Christian sages said that it was not a part of it. It was only something that happened after they were banished from Eden. And this is symbolic of the overall view of marriage and intimacy in our faiths. In the Jewish view, marriage is intrinsically holy relations are intrinsically holy. This is a special, inherently holy and good thing, not a reluctant thing that we do because the human being is weak. In fact, in Judaism, the, the, the concept of marriage is called kiddushin. Kiddushin means holiness. The act itself, marriage itself, and everything that comes along with it is inherently holy. It's an objective good. And this is one difference. There are a few things that distinguish the Jewish view of the afterlife with some of the other Abrahamic faiths, Christianity and Islam, for example. In Judaism, the afterlife is something that is open universally. It's something that it's not only convert to our faith, and those are the only people that can merit being with God and reaping the rewards of their actions. In other faiths, the Abrahamic faiths, the stress is much more on being a part of us. You're either one of us or you're excluded from the club. In Christianity, for many centuries, this was the primary, the fundamental belief. Believe in the Savior, you wind up in the right place. You wind up in heaven. You'll be with God. Eternal salvation, eternal glory, eternal wonderful things. Don't accept him. You're on your own. Not only on your own, burn eternally in hellfire. Be punished forever in Christianity. It's our way or the highway. Now, over the centuries, different denominations have sort of opened up 
uh, a little bit more. Some denominations are, are less uh, focused on our way or the highway, in particular to the Jewish community, acknowledging that uh, our covenant with God that was established at Mount Sinai, even from their perspective, is still valid. And they many of them say that the, the Jews still have a, a past. But as a general trend, as a general worldview, it's our way or the highway, accept the Savior or be damned eternally. In Islam, it's it's very similar in, in, a, cer in a certain sense that you have to acknowledge God. And if you're, don't, if you're not a person that acknowledges God and uh, and lives the, uh, and lives the life as is prescribed by Islam then you also wind up in their version of hell very similar which is also uh, talked about as fiery lake of fire and, and all of the uh, all of the things that are discussed uh, the way that people think of hell in Buddhism there's an idea that Buddhism for one, doesn't essentially believe in God. There is no God in the same way that we uh, would view uh, God in the Abrahamic faiths. In Buddhism, the idea of the afterlife is based on the moral code that you live by during your life. In particular, what is, what's done towards the end of your life, your, your last feelings and your last deeds that you did towards the end of life, that'll determine what you will be reincarnated as in your next life. So the, in Buddhism, it's much more of a uh, recycled system based on your deeds that you'll, you'll wind up as something coming back into the system as something else. In Judaism, we have the idea of reincarnation. We also have the idea of reward and punishment. But in our faith, it's not our way or the highway. Judaism very much believes, uh, the, uh, one of the core of our faith, the, one of the fundamental principles of our faith, is that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, and through a Jewish person involving themselves in all of the commandments, they perfect their life, they perfect the world, which is why God created this world. And they'll be rewarded for that, both sometimes in this world and most mostly in the afterlife. They'll be rewarded for all the good things that they did. And any sort of things, any things that they were lacking in, they might have to uh, get some cleanup. And with that, with the, the cleanup that can come in various forms, that can come from a temporary time of, of purification, of Gehenna, of punishment. Uh, it'll, it can also come from reincarnation. It can be, God can be kind and give the person sort of another shot to correct a certain thing that they need to elevate themselves. But also, Judaism is not exclusive. The afterlife in Judaism is very inclusive. A non-Jewish person, that lives a moral life, that follows the moral code that was given to first to Adam and then re-emphasized to Noah, or all descendants of Noah, every human being is a descendant of Noah. A person who follows that moral code, lives a godly moral life, our tradition says that that person also has a place in the world to come, will also be with God, will also have fulfilled his, role, his or her role in the world. So we are very much inclusive of everybody who wants to live a good and godly life. In our faith in Judaism, we, ha we believe in measure for measure. God interacts with the world and each individual in a way of measure for measure. Sometimes we don't necessarily know the exact cause and effect we say, why do bad things happen to good people? We don't know all of the measure for measure, cause and effect, how that works exactly. But we are, one of the fundamentals of our faith is that there's reward and punishment. There's cause and effect. There's uh, an outcome in all of these different things. So punishment, earthly punishment, is something that is measure for measure. So there, there's the very famous phrase Right? Everyone knows from biblical terminology. If you know any phrase from the Bible, an eye for an eye, right? And that's that is the that is the quintessential idea of measure for measure, right? Eye for an eye. Take out someone's eye, you get your eye taken out. However, in our tradition, eye for an eye is not meant literally. The oral tradition especially brings out the idea that eye for an eye, although it's meant to be 
in measure, that, there, that it is measure for measure, is not actually talking about poking out someone's eye. And our tradition gives various examples of why we know that's not the case. What if somebody, what if the person who poked out the guy's eye already has one, has an eye that's not functioning himself? What if he's one third blind already, or, or when he blinds the other guy, he blinds him only a third of his vision? Are we going to reciprocate and only take away one third of the perpetrator's vision? No. What it's talking about is that measure for measure, that person is compensated for the value of their eye, whatever that's determined to be by the court. Now, why not just say that? Why doesn't the Bible just say, why doesn't the Torah say, an eye in exchange for money? Why does it say an eye for an eye? Because the Torah doesn't want that a person should view the world and damage that they cause in a callous sort of way. It doesn't want to view the world, okay, I'll just blind that person, I'll write a check. And I'll go blind all my whole neighborhood. If I get mad at someone, I'll just blind them and I'll write checks out. About what's the value of an eye? A thousand dollars? All right. Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to go uh, blind all my enemies and here, just give out some checks. The idea is measure for measure that an eye for an eye. Really, in the divine scheme, you should have your eye. To, right? You're, you should have, you blind someone, you should be blinded. But God is merciful and allows that, that the actual uh, compensation is done financially. You still have to appease the person. You still have to repent. There's, there's many details that go into that, but it's not meant in the literal sense. Again, measure for measure, yes, everything is cause and effect. That's the right thing. But the way that the world practically works is that there are there's a judicial system and it's balanced out the way that it's meant to. In other faiths, Islam, for example, eye for an eye, or the concept of eye for an eye as it's discussed in the Quran, and even in the Islamic oral tradition, is meant in a literal sense. In some countries that are living their, their, that, that live in, a, in an Islamic modeled uh, nation, like Saudi Arabia, for example, a person could have their arm amputated or their hand amputated if they steal, for example, right? You steal something, there's, there's actual, and, and th this is not part of our faith of, of damaging a person, of hurting, physically hurting a person, but to the recognition though that everything is dealt with tit for tat. Things like the death penalty in Judaism and in other faiths, again, we find a similar thing. In other faiths, there's discussion and debate as to the death penalty, the role of death penalty, a positive view of the death penalty, a negative view of the death In Judaism, conceptually, the death penalty exists. The Torah talks about certain sins that are liable to the death penalty. Yet, the Torah also recognizes that in order for that sort of perfect judgment to be handed down, there has to be a perfect justice system, which hasn't existed in over 2,000 years. Even when that perfect justice system, the Grand Sanhedrin, was available, when that was a thing, our tradition teaches that if a person was executed, if one person was executed in seven years, and some opinions, once in 70 years, that that was considered a bloody court. The way we see it in the movies, or the way we tend to think about it from other religious faiths, is that when somebody does something wrong, stone them. The crowd gathers, they start throwing rocks at them until the person dies. In our justice system, even though the death penalty is something that is mentioned in the Torah, the idea is that very, very few people were ever actually punished in that particular way. What the Torah is doing is telling us that it's using the terminology to express, to stress how severe a crime these particular sins are and that what the punishment in theory should have been. But the, the tit for tat, the measure for measure, can only be actually facilitated by a perfect court, which is not something that we have today. And even if it was, the stipulations that go into creating that are very, very difficult to fulfill. 
The Jewish view of Mashiach, of the Messiah, is similar to the view of the afterlife, meaning that we are inclusive. In the same way that Judaism believes that people of all backgrounds, of all different cultures and denominations, can enter into the next world if they live a godly and moral life following God's moral code, the same thing is relevant when discussing Mashiach, the Messiah, and the Messianic era that surrounds that. In Judaism, you don't have to be a Jew to benefit from the Messianic era. There will be non-Jews in the Messianic era. The main idea in our faith is that the world will work together under the leadership of the Messiah to make the world imbue, be imbued with godliness. When, when the Messiah comes, the things that really are going to change is mostly in people's perception of life. The miracles and the other fan, fanfare and things that people think about with Mashiach are all good and they're all positive and, and, and they have their place in the discussion. But the main change when we talk about the world now and the world when Mashiach comes is where is the goal? Where is the heart? Where is the soul? Where is the mind of the world? When Mashiach comes, the mind of the world will be to exalt the glory of God, that the world will want to exalt the glory of God, that everything that we do in all fields of work and all, whatever, whatever role a person has in the world, their job will be directed towards the glory of God. We'll work together. We'll have a world of peace, a world of using all of our talents and best abilities to exalt the glory of God. Sounds really good. And that'll just be under the leadership of the Messiah. The Messiah in our faith is a human being, born of human parents, flesh and blood, who acts as a king. He's a descendant of King David. And the Messiah is not supernatural, not a deity, not quasi-deity. And that's why I think a lot of people, a lot of people in the Jewish world, are a little bit scared of the idea of Mashiach. Because everything that they hear, especially Jews that live predominantly secular lives or never learn too much about the Mashiach, that they, when they hear the word Mashiach, Messiah, they think of another faith. They think of Christianity. And so in Christianity, the idea of the Messiah and the Messianic era, the Messiah in Christianity, we know, is someone that is not just a human being. It is a quasi-deity. It's part of the Godhead. And again, different, different, denomination of, different denominations of Christianity view the role of Jesus of Nazareth in a different way in different ways, but the predominant view of the Trinity is that he plays a role, that he is actually part of the Godhead, that he is God in human form. This idea of the Messiah is completely foreign to Judaism. Judaism, human being, person of flesh and blood. In fact, the Messiah in Judaism is more like a job description, that every generation has a righteous individual who is born of the lineage of King David, father to son, father to son, who will be a king and is righteous and, and engages his generation in righteousness, teaches Torah and brings the generation to where they need to be. And if God decided that that was the right time, that person, person one designated person in each generation, would fulfill the role of Messiah because Messiah is a job description. Mashiach is a job description. You either fulfill it or you don't fulfill it. It's either the right time or it's not the right time. It's, it doesn't have all of this supernatural mir miracles and quasi-deity attached to it. And quite frankly, in Islam as well, Islam believes that Jesus is the Messiah, but doesn't attribute any sort of divine nature to him. They all, in fact, in, in Islamic circles, Jesus is identified as Muslim. Right? He's, he, he, he was just, he was, he was, uh, he was a prophet among other prophets. Muhammad is the key prophet, but Jesus' role is as Messiah. And so that's pretty interesting. But again, in Islam, the role that he plays is not as a deity, is not as someone who is God in human form, as a, a person, a prophet. Judaism 
negates all, negates all of that, that where it's just where it's a human being born of flesh and blood who guides the world to where it needs to be. The other faiths as well, it's their way or the highway, just like the afterlife. Who's going to be part of the messianic redemption? Well, if you're a Christian in many denominations of Christianity, it'll be the Christians. Everyone else will be punished. It'll be judgment day. You didn't accept their savior. And so to hell with you, literally. In Islam, in certain, again, in certain forms, denominations, there's a similar idea as well. Judaism is very universal. The Torah is universal. The Torah doesn't say you have to be like us. You have to share our beliefs. The Torah says live a goodly and godly life. Follow the moral code that God bestowed to humanity, and you'll have a place both in the times of the Messiah and in the afterlife.